March was National Kidney Month, and while we may be into April, those suffering from kidney disease need our support year around. Now, we have in studio a recent kidney transplant recipient, and of course, you might remember her from Cable 14. Severina Scazzari is here to talk to us about her journey and uh, how things can make a difference. Severina, nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Um, it's been a while since we've had you in the Cable 14 studios, but a uh, refresher to our viewers out there. You hosted and produced uh, a few shows here, I believe it was? Yes, I think I started at 14 and I was there until 22, which is yeah. five years ago. It's a long, <laughs> long time, long yeah. time. And dur <laughs> during that process, you also then got into your own business. You're also a PR and a consultant, you deal with a lot of NHL players and such, right? Yeah, and anybody who knew me then swore I'd never work in sports, so it was a surprise to all of us. Yeah, well, it just goes to show you, determination <laughs> and plugging away gets you, gets you uh, to where you want to be. Not without a few hurdles, and you've had a few of them with the kidney transplant. So take us maybe through the uh, the little, a bit of a journey. How did you start to know something was wrong with you and, and then the process? So I was born, my kidneys never fully developed in the womb. So okay. we always kind of knew that I would need a transplant in my 20s and 30s. And then as soon as puberty hit, um, we started to see the hormones effects on the kidney. Function started to decline rapidly every year. We continued to monitor it, then COVID hit, and we were really worried about having the transplant at that point, so we were just trying to keep things stable. And then finally, last year, January 5th, 2023, I received my transplant. So leading up to the transplant, what were some things that you had to do, the family had to do to make sure that you're looked after? Because you have an immune deficiency, obviously. And you, you know, getting sick is not a good thing in your world. So, so how was your life? How was your life kind of leading up to that? It was very isolating. The yeah. pandemic years and didn't see family, didn't see friends, and it was kind of annoying going on social media and seeing people out and about, completely ignoring restrictions. And I was just very lonely doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. And then finally going into surgery, I was excited because I could have visitors, but as soon as I got admitted, there was a COVID outbreak on the floor. <laughs> COVID outbreak on the floor. So yeah. did everything stop at that point or did you go through with the surgery? I had to go through with the surgery, okay. but no family or friends around. But with that said, whose kidney did you get? I ended up getting my dad's kidney. How did that conversation go between dad and daughter? Only daughter, mm. only child. So he was always the backup plan. Initially, my mom was supposed to be the donor. I was fortunate that they were both a match, but because he's the one working and supporting us, it made sense for her to do it. Some health issues happened on her end, so he got approved, and it was a no-brainer to do it for him. So dad's a match uh, for you. Did you have to go through various meetings and uh, consultations with doctors and everything? A lot of getting poking and prodded at <laughs> those last couple of months. A lot of, of months. blood work. <laughs> yeah, a lot of blood work. They have to make sure that the kidney's okay, there's no veins running through, which side to take it from. Then they have to look at tissue typing, virus tests. They gave him a psych evaluation to make sure that it was his will that he was doing it. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's quite the process. And I should ask, was it right or left side kidney? Um, it was my right side that they put it on, his left Okay. Yeah. Oh, so they can take someone's left side yeah. and put it on your right. Oh, yeah. see, I learned something today. That's awesome. Okay. So, day of surgery. Yeah. Um, take us through that day. Terrifying. I was very panicked. Uh, he went in first at nine o'clock in the morning, and then I had to go in in the afternoon. A lot of people think that you go in at the same time, which doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's not like you're lying in bed side by side. No. It comes out and goes right in right. you. Right, <laughs> yeah, because it's a four-hour surgery for yeah. him and then a four-hour surgery for me. So just the anxiety, hoping that things go well for him and feeling a bit of guilt because if something does happen to him, then it's on me. So then we get the news and around 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he's out of surgery. Everything's good. Then they prep me. I go in, the last thing I remember the surgeon saying is I read about you in the Globe and Mail last week, and then I was out cold. Mm -hmm. And then I wake up, everybody's panicking around me. I'm still coming to it a little bit out of it. And they're talking about having to bring me back into the operating room. And I start freaking out. I had 24 seven care for the first three days, and I was on surgery watch. Ice chips, one tablespoon every hour until they cleared me. And then it was just a mess from there. <laughs> so, 
yeah, you, you go through all of this and you want the happy ending. Mm -hmm. However, you have had many hurdles since. Uh, can you kind of give us a, a brief overlook of, as to what you have been dealing with post-surgery? Yeah, so I'll give you the Coles Notes version. Yeah. Um, so multiple blood transfusions while I was in the hospital post-operation. I left after 13 days, and then we were good until April. Rejection scare, steroid treatments. Pretty much had a manic episode from the steroids. Lost my hair, gained weight, uh, had the shakes. Couldn't dress myself, couldn't feed myself, couldn't drive. Then things start to get better around August, September, PTSD diagnosis. Also had my first biopsy, didn't find anything. November, second biopsy, three blood viruses. And now I have one blood virus left and they're looking at my bone marrow because my white blood cell count is low. So it's an adventure. It's an adventure. So I have to ask, during all of this, Severina, how are you coping? Um, yeah, I have my good days and my bad days. The PTSD was very paralyzing those first few months until I got the diagnosis and treatment. And it's really hard to find that mental health support clinically because there's so many people that need it and so few resources. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, having mom and dad there as your sole support, that, that is crucial, uh, having mom and dad there. Dad got through this no problem, no, he's and he's still doing well. No, yeah. What are some next steps for you? You mentioned you still got one of the blood diseases. Mm -hmm. You're looking at that. Um, but how, how, what's the next six months look like for you? Or is it, hey, we'll wait and see, lots of monitoring still? Yeah, lots of monitoring still, which kind of drives me crazy as a control freak and perfectionist. Yeah. Uh, are you able to go out now at least with some friends and have a little bit of fun and go to a ball game or a hockey game? And yeah. how's the diet? Are you able to eat what you want? Are you watching that based on what you can, calorie intake and all that? Or? Yeah, like I'm pretty much back to normal in okay. terms of getting out. And then there's some food restrictions, yeah. but... I think at this point I've accepted that this is as normal as it's going to get. <laughs> so as, as someone who has been going through this, what is your what are some words or wisdom that you can pass along to others that might be just starting this process? I would say to seek some mental health support clinically before it even begins because there's a grieving process that comes with it where you're mourning the loss of the old you and your life's completely different afterwards regardless of where you're coming from pre-transplant you could come from the worst of conditions and it's just adapting to not knowing what's going to happen and not having full control over your life and having to trust the doctors. You trust in the doctors right now? I am. I'm very fortunate. You have some good um, Yeah. Good to have that team behind yeah. you. And, and everything that's happened to you isn't based on what the doctors did. This is no. just how the system is reacting and things, how they're kind of put together in, in yeah. you now. Um, as an ambassador for, for Kidney Month, which was last month, mm -hmm. and you're involved with the community. What are you doing to try to help and how's, this, how's the group doing? And I'm working with St. Joe's directly to make sure that I see the impact that's on the patients from whatever work I do. Mm -hmm. My focus is on the mental health support. It's just as important as the physical recovery. If not, it helps the physical recovery if you have your mind. Mm -hmm. So we're planning a fundraiser in September with DJ Danny D and Tony Monaco from Z1035. And we're almost at $15,000 just from donations and we sold out of tickets within an hour. Oh, well, well that is truly wonderful. But this is, this is something that you will have to live with for the rest of your life, so you're going to be look, watching yourself. But for other individuals out there that might not be as fortunate, mm -hmm. um, what are some things that they should really be looking for if they're just not feeling right? Like, is watch your urine, go for blood tests, get, mm -hmm. like, what are some things they should do? I mean, I feel like just go to your family doctor, yeah. get those tests, and then mentally ask for support as soon as you notice something's off, because the longer you wait, the harder it can be to get that support. That's for sure. That's for sure. Um, you have a very bright future ahead of you. You know that, right? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> no, you, you do. Uh, you're in line with a lot of professional athletes. I'm sure you get a lot of support there, even though through your PR company, you're giving them a lot of support. Having that, those connections, does that give you some 
positivity and makes you kind of smile throughout the day with your work? Yeah, it's been really special, especially yeah. having athletes and agents reach out. I got a signed Montreal Canadiens jersey from the whole team just yeah. to wish me well. And the wives and girlfriends are another community that I'm really grateful to be a part of. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. And you know, you're also part of the Cable 14 family and community. Yes. Once you're here, <laughs> we never forget about you. So whenever you want to come in here and talk a little bit more, about your journey, about other things that are happening, please give us a call. Love to have you back here on the desk, okay? I appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Severina, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. All the best to you. Uh, Hamilton, do not forget to follow us on X at THN on C14. If you have any story ideas for an upcoming episode, you can also send us your suggestions to THN at cable14.com.